Hello and welcome to the Moonshots podcast. It is a massive, a huge, an epic episode 68. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the boy from Brooklyn, Mr. Chad Owen. Yeah, but we're not alone today, Mike. I'm so excited. We're bringing a guest back onto the Moonshots podcast. So why don't you introduce our illustrious guests here we have with us this evening? I am very, very happy to introduce uh, somebody who has talked innovation, thought innovation, and most importantly, he's got the job done. Joining us today on the show is Mr. Mark Hatch, who is a speaker, writer, advisor, and general all-round innovation guru. Mark Hatch, welcome to the Moonshots podcast. Hey, Mike and Chad. Thank you so much. And it is great to have you here because all three of us share a love for one of the greatest business writers in history, and we are going to revisit someone today. So, Chad, With no further ado, let's set up today's show, which is a very, very special episode of the Moonshots podcast. We don't often revisit subjects here on the podcast, but after the recent passing of Clayton Christensen, we could not go another week without recording a show a bit in memoriam for him, both to revisit The Innovator's Dilemma, but also his wonderful book, How We Measure Your Life. And... um, We wanted to bring a guest on who's both done lots of reading, but as Mike mentioned, more importantly, been one of those uh, innovators out there in the world doing the work. So we're real excited to bring you some more clips from Clay and uh, to see how much more learning we can do from him. Absolutely. And I think that uh, how lucky are we to revisit Clay Christensen and to also share this experience with one of our friends who's been in the trenches He has the scars of battle. (laughs) Is that fair to say, Mark? Absolutely. (laughs) So how exciting. And look, for our listeners that haven't had the chance to know Clay's work, I think there's a couple of thoughts here. Personally, I think for all of us here on the show, his work and particularly his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, has been a permanent piece of our must-read bookshelf. It's one of those books, The Innovator's Dilemma, that perhaps you could read every year and get new insights. But without a doubt, it is recognized as by far the preeminent book on innovation. But I think what says the most is it's often regarded as the most influential business book of the last hundred years. I think it's fair to say Clay Christensen is right up there with Peter Drucker as the two co-godfathers of business innovation. Chad, how do you feel revisiting Clay's body of work knowing that we are going to the source, if you will, of innovation? Yeah, I can't help but see all kinds of similarities to Drucker. And I'm curious, Mark, someone you know that's had your recent experience of reading lots of innovation articles as you're continuing your educational journey and in innovation, how you see Clay's work as kind of the foundation of so much of what's come out in the intervening 20, 25 years? I couldn't agree more uh, with the one, the recognition of Drucker and then the movement to Clay. I actually had the opportunity to take one of my MBA classes, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, from Peter at Claremont. But Peter really based his views off his, you know, personal experience of just being in the trenches. And so, you know, he described the seven different ways that people tend to innovate. What Clay did was he took that idea and he drove it down to empirically based data. And this was one of the very first times where he took a broad topic like innovation and was able to dig into the data that was available and give practitioners not just his opinion and what he's seen as far as trends, but actual hardcore, this is what you're seeing in the trenches, this is what's happening empirically, and here's the response that you need to have. And that's an innovation in and of itself. The ability to start professionalizing the innovation thought process was absolutely genius. And it's so remarkable because that's really the approach that we've seen a number of our favorite authors of recent times. Uh, You would argue that that's exactly how Jim Collins built the good to great model. Then even if you go towards Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, they're all using that pioneering approach from Clay Christensen. But here is what the craziest thing is. Apart from being a godfather of innovation, 
writing one of the most influential business books in history, what's totally ridiculous about Clay Christensen is he actually, in his body of work, produced another book, which was turning the lens away from the business onto ourselves. And Chad, I know we've shown a fondness for this. Why don't you explain how remarkable Clay is in terms of his other great piece of work? He also wrote a book, How Will You Measure Your Life? And I think as he got older and wiser and began to reflect on his career and students that he was teaching, I think he wanted to be able to leave them with something above and beyond just some good business advice and you know what it means to be an innovator. And so he takes the seed of these three questions that he has everyone ask of themselves and he elaborates it into the book. But he has an interesting way of kind of taking the innovator's dilemma framework and asking similar questions, but as you said, kind of applied to your personal life. And so I think what kind of underlies it all is to not just be satisfied with yourself and to be asking, continually asking more, not only of your company, but also of yourself. And so in some ways, it's kind of only natural that he would write a book like that. But yeah, the fact that he's so well written on kind of both ends of the spectrum, I think it just goes to show that the kind of deep and contemplative, you know, wise thinker he was. Absolutely. Well, we shouldn't keep everybody hanging. I know everybody is dying to see us decode, understand and interpret Clay's work. Just quickly before we do that, Chad, where should everybody go if they want to know more about Moonshots? You can always find previous episodes, list of future episodes and a contact form at moonshots.io. And we always love those ratings and reviews on iTunes. And big shout out to those of you that have left recent reviews. Yeah, we've been pushing that pretty hard. I think we're up to like 74 reviews and ratings across the podcast planet. That's so, so great because we're very grateful for this because it gets uh, our show in front of new listeners and builds the Moonshot community. So thank you to everybody who's doing that. And if you are sitting on the train or the bus and you're listening to the show, please jump over into your favorite podcast application software and uh, leave us some thoughts, give us a rating because it really helps us and the show. All right, Chad, I think we're dying to jump in. Where should we start our adventure into the world of Clay Christensen? Well, I think we have to start with what is the innovator's dilemma? So here we've got a clip of Clay telling us exactly what the dilemma is. Yeah. So the dilemma is in, in every company, every day, every year, people are going into senior management, knocking on the door saying, I got a new product for us. And some of those entail making better products that you could sell for higher prices to your best customers. A disruptive innovation generally has to ca cause you to go after new markets, people who aren't your customers. And, uh, and the product that you want to sell them is something that is just so much more affordable and simple that your, your current customers can't buy it, you know? And so the choice that you have to make is, should we make better products that we could sell for better profits to our best customers? Or maybe we ought to make worse products that none of our customers would buy that would ruin our margins. What should we do? And that really is the dilemma. So one of the things I really like about your, your ideas is that they really do ha have had an impact out there. I mean, this, some of this thinking has, without question, influenced a whole generation of managers, including people like Steve Jobs, your reference in the biography that he, that he read the book and was very influenced by the book, and possibly Apple I and Apple II are, you know, him resolving the innovator's dilemma. Yeah. But also Andy Grove at Intel. You had a, you had a contact with him. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I never imagined that I could ever meet these people, you know, let alone be just as having helped them. But I, I, taught, I learned a lot from Andy Grove. So what happened was I was just at HBS minding my own business and uh, Indel called, or Andy Grove called me just out of the blue and said, look, I'm a busy man. I don't have time to read drivel from academics, you know, but somebody told me you had this theory and I wondered if you could come out and present what you're learning to me and my staff, uh, and then tell us what it how it applies to Intel. And for me, it was a chance of a lifetime. So I flew out there, and uh, it turned out Andy was, he's quite a gruff man. And he said, you know, stuff's happened to us. 
uh, we only have 10 minutes for you. So just tell us what it means for Intel. And I said, Andy, I can't because I have no opinion about Intel, but the theory has an opinion. And so I have to describe the theory. So he sat back impatiently and 10 minutes into it, he chucked me off and he said, look, I got your stupid theory. Tell us what it means for Intel. And he got what he got and he really did get it. You know? And I said, Andy, I, I, I need five more minutes because I got to describe how this process of disruption worked its way through a totally different industry just so you can visualize what can happen to Intel. So I described how the mini mills came in to the steel market at rebar and then went up market. When I was done with that, Grove said, oh, I get it. So what you're telling me it, it means for Intel is, and he described how they had two companies coming at them from below and Intel needs to go down and, and not let them go up against us. And it was very successful. And so, that was the Celeron process. Yeah, that's right. And I've thought about this. If I'd have been suckered into telling Andy Grove what he should do, I'd have been killed because he knew so much more about microprocessors than I ever would know. But rather than telling him what to think, I taught him how to think. And he could reach the, his own conclusions. And that changed the way I teach. It's, it changed the way I talk. And... The, the, the insight is that, you know, for whatever reason, the way they designed the world, data is only available about the past. And when we teach people that they should be data-driven and fact-based and analytical as they look into the future, in many ways we condemn them to take action when the game is over. The only way you can look into the future, there's no data, so you have to have a good theory. And we don't think about it, but every time we're taking an action, it's predicate, predicated upon a theory. And so by teaching managers to look through the lens of a theory into the future, you can actually see the future very clearly. Hmm. Seeing the future clearly. There was so much in that clip. I don't really know where to start, but... I love the focus on understanding the theory. So Mark Hatch, I want to hit you up with a question. When you listen to Clay then, apart from being amazed that here is one guy who has influenced two of the most important companies of the last 50 years, both Intel and Apple, stepping back from that, when you relate to what he describes as this innovator's dilemma, I'd love to know where you experience it where you see it the most, when you reflect on your career, your adventures in entrepreneurship, when you talk to executives, where do you see this the most today? How does it manifest? What does it look like? What's a good example of this innovator's dilemma? So picking up where Clay just left off is the, you know, like the how to think. And thinking about innovation, how you think about innovation, particularly disruptive breakthrough and so forth, is completely different than how you manage an existing enterprise. And, you know, general managers didn't get to the general management role, and even the CEO did not get to the CEO role, unless they're founders on average, really thinking about how to innovate. They got there by optimizing what they're currently doing, motivating employees, meeting the quarter by quarter. And what Clay was talking about is just, you know, it's brilliant. I describe it as a rear view mirror development where you use the data that you've seen in the rear view mirror, and the faster you go, it's like you're trying to race a potential highway patrolman coming on to the freeway. The faster you go, the more time you spend looking in the rear view mirror, the less time you're looking out in front of you. And there are so many examples of this. The computer, one of the inventors of the computer was Amdahl came to, I don't remember the name, but they did an analysis and said, well, you know, a mainframe, we only need five computers because all the data that we've ever created can be housed on those five computers, and we don't need any more than that. Or cell phones, where a famous uh, you know, consulting firm came back to AT&T and said the total market for cell phones is 10,000. Well, these are completely rational conclusions based on looking in the rearview mirror. And then personally, I was involved in trying to convince a company to get into the wide format inkjet printing business in a very big way. 
And again, a consulting company came in, did a global survey and discovered, you know, that the total market size was $100 million and that if it doubled over the next five years, it'd be a $200 million market. And that wasn't anywhere near large enough to be interesting. And what they missed was like massive new uses for wide format printing in retail where JCPenney's and Sears could then distribute and print rather than print and distribute flyers and where we could put cool mats on the ground and people could walk over them highlighting things that were on the shelf. I mean, entirely new markets that were painfully obvious if you were willing to look through the windshield. They just weren't there in the data. And the trick, I think, as Clay was saying, it's not you know what to think, it's how to think. How do you train executives to think differently about innovation than they do about their day-to-day job? Isn't it so powerful that the greatest teacher himself became a better teacher through actually working with Andy Grove at Intel and showing him the theory, showing him how to think rather than trying to quickly prescribe, if you will, the medicine to the patient. So I'm thinking out loud here, Chad, I mean, how do we think in the right way using Clay's thoughts? Like now knowing that there is this innovator's dilemma, What are some of the things we can do to start putting this in place? What do you see people doing well when they practice Clay's theory? Practicing Clay's theory is quite difficult because if you kind of look at the letter of the law, you are operating at a fundamental disjointedness from your core business. And we've got a clip coming up here in just a little bit that really dives into what exactly does he mean when he says disruptive innovation. But I Still to this day, I think I first read this book, I don't know, maybe six or seven years ago, but I'm always collecting data points and examples of companies that have entered the market as disruptive innovators or companies that came out with disruptive innovations. I mean, even today, I was reading a, an email newsletter from someone and he was bringing up the example of Dollar Shave Club. And I was like, oh, that's a perfect example of a disruptive innovation. You know, P&G spent million to buy the Gillette brand. That was going to be their quote unquote low entry, you know, into the market. But then they get totally disrupted by a company that comes in and ships razors to your door for a buck a month. And it was just fun for me to come across that example today. But I think on a practical level, it's going back to the book and understanding all the different examples that he gives, you know, whether it's the hard drives companies that he talks about or the steel mills or even like the backhoe you know, ground shoveling and moving excavator companies, you know, very funny seeming examples, but they're all prove really fantastic examples that make it easier to identify the type of innovation in the wild. So before we get to this other clip, one thing that is really coming to my mind when we talk about this innovator's dilemma, I think about the characteristics of when companies are trapped in the dilemma, when they can't see the disruptive innovation that they should do, or they wake up too late to somebody else coming into their market. And characteristically, I want to try this on both of you. I think when an organization becomes obsessed with operating in today, when executives are literally fully booked on calls from eight till six, when companies and teams never get outside of the office for a day to think when nobody is talking about the next three or five years, when the vision is something that is only plastered on the wall and is not something that is embedded in their practice. I'm going to suggest to both of you, I don't know what you think, Mark, but I think those are some of the symptoms if you're suffering the dilemma. You've lost foresight, you you are consumed by keeping the trains running on the time, and you're not thinking, you're not creating time and space to think about what might be next. What do you think, Mark? It's a natural byproduct of what's required in a typical office. Um, you know, just attending to the existing business is a full-time job. And the discipline is in carving out part of the time to actually think about the future. And you know you're in trouble when investing in the future and thinking about the future gets that second seat. And you view it as a penalty. It's like, this is a penalty I'm trying to pay, and I just don't have time for it. At that point, you're in deep trouble. And the the problem is the markets don't respond well to when you're thinking about what's going to happen in five and 10 years and what kind of investments I'm going to be making. 
they want to see that cash flow come out on the bottom because they're trying to maximize current, current quarter. And so balancing the two, in my mind, that's true management. The other thing that you're doing is you're just working. <laughs> Fine. There's a difference between work and management. You know, work responding to every task that hits your desk. Management is prioritizing those tasks and creating a balance so that you are working on today's requirements and tomorrow's. <laughs> well, and I think that's why he calls it dilemma. It is a dilemma. And if you're not feeling it, you're probably in trouble. Yeah, it's almost that classic discussion between what's important versus what is urgent. I mean, there's a reason that philosophers spend so much time on paradoxes and, and dilemmas. They're, they're endlessly uh, fascinating and kind of bottomless uh, discussions that we can have. So to bring us out, Clay's work can often be misconstrued or mislabeled. I think he's opined in his later years that the term disruptive innovation uh, was kind of co-opted and began to mean things that he had never intended. So to help get all of us back into the right mindset and maybe a bit more true to his original writings, let's hear from Clay himself what he actually meant when he's talking about his description of disruptive innovation. You're best known for the idea of disruptive innovation. What exactly is disruptive innovation? Explain it. A disruptive innovation is not a breakthrough innovation that makes uh, good products a lot better. But it, we, it has a very specific definition, and that is it transforms a product that historically was so expensive and uh, complicated that only a few people with a lot of money and a lot of skill had access to it. A disruptive innovation makes it so, more, so much more affordable and accessible that a much larger population have access to it. So there's almost an element of democratization of a technology. That, that that's product? exactly right. And so it creates markets, but the leaders who made the complicated, expensive stuff find it very hard to move in the direction of affordable and simple because it is incompatible with their business model. And so it's, it's a, um, almost a paradox within itself. But what it says is, if you're a little boy and you want to kill a giant, the way you do it is by going after this kind of a product where the leader is actually motivated to walk away from you rather than engage you. So give us an example of this. I mean, most people are familiar with the computer industry and how that's developed. Perhaps you can use that as an example. Yeah, so at the beginning, the, the first manifestation of digital technology was a mainframe computer. It cost several million dollars to buy, and it took years to be trained to operate these things. And so that meant that the largest corporations and the largest universities could have one, you know. And so we had to take our problem to the center where the experts solved it for us. But then there's a sequence of innovations from the mainframe to a mini to a, a desktop to a laptop and now to a smartphone that has made uh, democratized technology to the point that everybody has access to it around the world. And we are much better off. It was very hard, though, for the pro pioneers of the industry to catch these new waves. Most of those were uh, created and dominated by new companies. Uh, I mean, this is some of the most exciting thinking possible. Because as you listen to Clay, you begin to understand that the disruption really is by virtue of the scaling of the technology. And I think there's such an important lesson here that a great idea or even, you know, a great prototype in a studio or a lab somewhere is not yet a disruptive innovation. And I think what we've seen with the iPhone, what we've seen with the internet, what we see with a lot of technologies that have the promise, whether it's quantum computing or, you know, mixed reality, AR, machine learning, they all have the promise of this disruption. But it's actually when we look back, not only at those internet technologies that I mentioned, you could even say, it's electricity on the grid, it's the railroad system, it's jumbo jets. These are disruptive technologies because they do it at scale. And I think in this lays such an important lesson. And the job is not done simply having the prototype. It's creating a product or a service at scale. And Mark, 
as you listened to Clay then, what are some of the important lessons you've learned about scaling a big idea, scaling a disruptive innovation? Yeah. So one of the key things in working with Clay's definition is that he is very specifically describing disruptive innovation as an innovator coming in from the bottom, having the cheapest solution, scaling it up, and then slowly eroding from the bottom what the incumbent has. And so when he described the mainframe and then the minis came in below the mainframes and eventually they became powerful enough and then the computers came in and then so forth. And so, I mean, he describes the iPhone as disruptive as in disrupting the laptop market. He does not describe the iPhone as disrupting the phone market. I mean, it was a very expensive phone, but it was a very cheap laptop. So therein lies some of the nuance and where some thinkers get in a little bit of trouble when they describe disruptive innovation. Just because it was disruptive and innovative in Clay's definition doesn't make it disruptive innovation. You know, it's something of an academic argument, but he tried very hard to keep that very clear. Specifically disruptive in his mind, disruptive innovation in his mind was a cheaper processor didn't do as much as the high-end Intel processor. And that over time, it would climb kind of up market. And then, you know, relative to what the maker movement experience was, what we were essentially doing, you know, these were large facilities, 20,000 square feet, every tool you need to make anything on the planet. But we were charging a monthly fee, $125 to $150 a month. And so what that did was you didn't have to buy the $20,000 laser printer. You didn't have to buy the $10,000 3D printer or the $50,000 CNC. You could just come in, learn how to use it and build your prototype and launch your company. So we were disrupting the equipment sale market by coming in and saying, no, you can lease these on a monthly basis and a kind of uh, ad hoc. So that's kind of context for specifically disruptive innovation. You know, when he talks about breakthrough, those are like rattle jumps where you're, you know, like the microprocessor was a breakthrough. It wasn't an incremental improvement. I would argue that the iPhone, there was a business model breakthrough when he moved from the iPod to the iPhone, and you are now able to keep your music, you know, inside of a phone that you already had. And more importantly, the business model that he broke, you were able to buy one song at a time. I mean, he broke the entire music industry where you had to buy 12 to 14 songs at a time on an album or a cassette or a CD. It was the, it was the death of the album, followed by, by version three, he introduced the app store, right? Yeah, he kept doing it. He broke business models all the time. I got the iPhone because of visual voicemail, like the ability to not have to sit at my desk or call into a phone and listen to 35 voicemails, one right after another, front to back, to know who called me was worth $1,000 by itself. And what was interesting is it, it actually required AT&T to re-architect their switches. This was not just a whole software thing. He actually convinced AT&T, you know, in exchange for an exclusive contract, to re-architect their internal infrastructure so that it could solve a particular customer problem. That was a breakthrough. You know, what the Chinese are now doing is they're just knocking off the iPhone. They're coming in from the bottom and giving them minimum features needed in order to be able to serve the customer. That is a classic disruptive innovation. So would you say you're, you're looking at uh, companies like Xiaomi as potential disruptors who are coming in from the bottom and working their way up? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's a classic approach. And Chad, I'm wondering, do you see any other companies sort of practicing this disruptive approach to innovation coming in from the bottom and working their way up? I already gave my one example from today, Dollar Shave Club. But the exciting ones for me are the direct-to-consumer companies. I still think many or most of them are overvalued. I mean, I actually, I think Casper IPO'd quite underwhelmingly today or yesterday. But, you know, going up against a company like Procter & Gamble, I do not envy the founders of those small direct-to-consumer companies because they're fighting behemoths. But going after the riches and the niches saying, I, I absolutely believe it, Getting one product done well and being much closer to the consumer, I think it's a model for success, but you have to be sure that you can, you know, have the business processes in place to keep, you know, the costs low. And there's so much that goes into being a disruptive innovator. You know, Clay may make it sound like it's easy because he's taking these examples. But yeah, again, I don't envy any of those companies that are trying 
to go against some of these giant companies. What a powerful lens. Like if you were starting a company right now in any, whether it's B2B or B2C, you could almost just start with Clay's formula. Whereas there are a big incumbent that's not interested enough in this low-hanging fruit, is busy servicing the cream of the crop where we can come in and steal the low end and do the march upwards. I mean, it's almost like the perfect way to start a new company, isn't it, Mark? It's a great way. And one of the things that he describes is that it's really a natural outcome of focusing on your best customers and continuing to give them more and more of what they want. And, you know, what happens over time is you start out with, say, a word processor that has a fairly simple instruction set and it's, you know, it's fairly obvious. And then over time, you know, 95% of the functionality isn't used by most of the folks. It's just too complicated. Like, who cares how you do footnotes? I'm just trying to write a memo. And then all of a sudden, Google comes along, buys actually a fairly poor piece of software and upgrades it. And you get the basic functionality that you need now for free. You can see it happens all the time. You're adding more bells and whistles to a car. You're adding more bells and whistles to computers. You're adding more bells and whistles to an office environment. And then somebody else comes along and says, what's the core need for you know, 30% of the market at the low end. Can I meet that particular thing? And as he said, the giant isn't interested in that part of the market. It's lower margin. It's not customers are currently servicing. They're hard to reach and they don't care. And so they walk away. That's how you beat a giant. You convince them to walk away. (laughs) Well, I mean, it just gets us to this point where we really need to sort of play into the dimensions of disruption. And I think Chad, a good way of thinking about it is there's really two sides to this whole world of disruption. Yeah, and we're just going to keep going back to Clips of Clay because he describes it so well, but he frames it in terms of threat and opportunity. So let's hear straight from Clay. I have a question for you. Is disruptive innovation, low end or new market, an opportunity or a threat? It's a good question, isn't it? Because almost always, disruption is an opportunity long before it's a threat. So new market disruption allows you to create new businesses, whole new markets. That's a great opportunity for you. And if you use it as a low-end disruption, it's an opportunity to gain market share from the existing players. Later on, as the technology gets good enough so that customers of the core business now start to defect or take customers away from you if you're being disrupted, that's a threat. But almost always, it's, a, it's an opportunity long before it becomes a threat. I think the first part is what is the mental mindset when you're looking at it? If your mindset is, I'm looking for the next big deal, it's got to be a billion dollar market or we're just not interested. I'm actually literally quoting scientists at a centralized research center. If it's not a billion dollars, then we are not actually tasked with looking at it. It's like, well, great, but it could be a billion dollar market in five years. And here are the reasons why. What he's looking at is what are the low cost entrants? What are the ways of creating a product that has 80% of the functionality? at 20% of the price. One of my favorite examples there was uh, Adobe's consumer version of Photoshop. You know, Photoshop's got stunning capabilities. And for the professional photographer and you know, magazine layout person, they needed those functionalities. But when they became concerned with these low-end products that were coming out, they went out and did a, you know, focus groups and audits to find out what does the consumer actually need? And there were like four to seven features that they needed. And sure, there may have been three or four others that they would have liked to have had, but they didn't build those in. They built that seven feature, you know, Photoshop Lite. They launched it at $49 and they crushed the market. And most importantly, they also blocked potential competitors. It was a genius move. But the fascinating thing is the product managers within Adobe, now I don't know this for a fact, but you can imagine what they were thinking. They've come up through the ranks. They came out of the best design schools. They've been building this feature set and their whole milieu is with these professional photographers. Now this company is going to launch what in their mind is a piece of junk. The internal conversations must have been fascinating. 
And so again, it's like, how are we looking at the market now? How are we looking at it the future? Then leads to the innovation. You're saying, what's my feature set? You're looking at it wrong because nobody in the world is going to say, well, what I, you know, I'm going to build X, but we're going to take out 90% of the functionality. <laughs> well, and they did it again. Adobe did it again with their Adobe cloud subscription service because it used to pay $1,000 per program. And, you know, there were at least a dozen programs in the creative suite. They disrupted their own business model and figured out how to adopt a SaaS model and allow anyone to use any of their products for just $49.99 a month. So yeah, I mean, they're a great example of seeing that opportunity before. I mean, I remember people that were complaining, like I'd rather pay $1,000 and own Photoshop than, you know, have to pay some subscription where I have to keep updating and downloading. But I think the success of Adobe has proven those uh, naysayers quite wrong. So Chad, if we're sitting in our office, sitting at our desk, and we're like, we want to take a look at the future, what would be some of the practical advice you'd have? What would you do if you were there sitting at Adobe and you're thinking about the next disruption? What are some of the things we can do to start forging our way towards that? How can we uncover those opportunities? I feel like this is a real softball, Mike. This is like T-ball here. <laughs> if you know Mike and I at all, we are in love with this analogy of working from the bottom up. And that can mean from the bottom of your organization and company. So putting out sensors and feelers to the bottom of the organization to understand what it is the people inside of the organization actually want to do and build. And then those people are working in close conjunction with customers out in the real world. And it can be existing companies or existing customers, but more importantly, in the case of disruptive innovation, people who aren't your customers. So if you have a product or service, put it in front of people who aren't your customers and understand why they aren't. And maybe what are some of those lower market entry points that you could try and prototype and bring to market that would serve those customers? And we'll link to some of these visuals. I and mean, there's some really interesting charts that are in the book, but most of the market share that's gained by these disruptive innovators are people that were never buying this type of product or service before. So it's opening up entirely new markets for these companies, which gives them that fuel that they can use to continually kind of ratchet up the value chain and build better products, you know, better features, et cetera. To build on that, Chad, I would say the first and most primary action, if you want to really unlock some opportunities with disruptive innovation, is to stay close to your customer and your potential customer. And there's a really good lens by which to do that, that Clay gave us, which is what are the jobs to be done of your customer? What are they trying to get done in life? What are the pains they experience? What are the gains they're looking for? And make sure that you objectively know, and importantly, don't guess what customers need and want in their lives. I truly believe if that we all continually do surveys, do customer interviews, get out in the real world, be a mystery shopper, and truly do an objective look at what customers need, I believe that that is the sharp end of innovation and opportunity. That's where we find the next big thing. But you know, this world of innovation is not for everyone. And some people can do this and some people can't. So we've got this next clip coming, and this is Clay talking about why some people are more innovative than others. It appears as if when we are born, th the, our brains are really quite similar, but early experiences in our childhood determine how our brains get wired to be more or less creative. Okay. And really creative people almost always have had two experiences as as young children. One is their fathers or mothers had a disposition always to fix things for themselves. So if something went wrong in the house, they would never call the repairman. They would always take it apart and fix it. And when, when they, they then worked with their fathers or mothers to fix things, it did two things. One is it gave them a curiosity to know how things work. Yeah. 
And innovative people always have that curiosity. They see, see something and they say, I wonder why that happens that way. And they want to take it apart and see. And that's a very important one. And then the other thing that that, that experience does for them is it gives them the confidence that if something is wrong, they can fix it. And innovation almost always is not successful the first time out. You, you try something and it doesn't work and it takes confidence then to say, well, we haven't failed yet. Let's try something else and then let's try something else and ultimately you become commercially successful. Yeah, this idea of who we are rooted in childhood is one that strikes home for me. I was a child that grew up with lots of computers in the home. And so that was my experience of repairing and building my own computers. I'm curious for you, Mark, if you had any other similar experiences in your younger years. So my father grew up during the Depression you know, on a farm. And, you know, there was no way you had time or the money to go down to the hardware store, which was 35 miles away buy the part which you couldn't afford, drive back and fix it. So if the fan belt fell off the tractor, you went in and got a uh, bicycle inner tube and you temporarily fixed the thing and finished the harvest. And that caused him to think differently. My favorite example, slightly off topic, but my mom came out once and dad pulled up into the driveway and with his suit on, immediately dove into the engine compartment to fix something. Of course, mom comes out and says, you know, Dean, what are you doing? You know, you've got a dress shirt on. And he turned around at her. And it's like, again, he's just in different mental models. He turned around at her and says, what do you want me to do? Put on a $3 t-shirt or use this dress shirt that I bought for a buck at the Salvation Army? <laughs> you know, it was a perfectly good dress shirt. It worked just fine. And it's kind of a depression era. Yeah, he fixed absolutely everything. On the confidence side, it's fascinating. Kaufman did a study a few years ago and one of the most important correlations they had between a successful entrepreneur and kind of their background and their approach is, and I like this term, irrational confidence. And this is Kaufman. So they did the statistics. It's like 93%, this was in Clayton's book, 93% of the companies that are successful are successful on a product they did not launch with or a market they did not go after, 93%. And so if you know that kind of statistic or you've seen it over and over, trust me, it's a lot easier to manage an existing business than it is to start a new one. That's just statistically true. And you do need to have some level of, I would consider it lots of confidence. Kaufman would describe it as irrational. <laughs> what I'll take issue with Kaufman is that they were looking at single at bats. They were not looking at a career trajectory, right? And so if you're an innovator, it's not a single at bat. And so, yes, you've got the confidence and you can figure it out. And you know what? So what? If it didn't work this time, I call that cheap learning. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You know, in baseball, you know, batting a 300 is great. All you need is one real good success and you're set. And that is so, so similar with entrepreneurship. To think everything's going to be a home run is just plain crazy. So batting at 300 is, in fact, a great run rate. Guys, what I decode from what Clay said just then is a theme that we have seen across so many of the people we've studied. When he's saying being curious, I think this is just a proxy for saying always learning. People who have this vast appetite to understand how the world works. So I love this idea of be curious and be confident. And inside of that confidence on the other side, we can also learn that there's a resilience because you will strike out but it's about the capacity to continue in the face of a failed experiment or a failed test. And I think these hallmarks that he calls out here in his work, I mean, if I was to look back at the 68 episodes, being strong and hard as nails, being courageous and relentless, as Lady Gaga said, and also being a lifelong learner, being curious about how the world works, and having the confidence to go out and fix it. I mean, these are not only lessons we can take from Clay, but they echo amongst all our shows, don't they, Chad? Especially some of the earlier ones, like Bill Belichick, you mentioned Lady Gaga, Oprah. Yeah, many of our oldies but favorites talk about those attributes. And I, I like how this is kind of a nice transition for us into the more you know personal side of Clayton's writing. We have a really fantastic clip that summarizes his thinking 
why he decided he wanted to write a book on how you measure your life and some of the core tenets within it. So let's hear from Clay on how you measure your life. Well, when I go back to my graduating classes, I graduated from the MBA program at Harvard in 1979. We have a reunion every five years. When we came back for our fifth reunion, man, everybody was happy. Most of our classmates had married people who were much better looking than my classmates. <laughs> They're doing well in their career. But as we hit the 10th and 15th and 20th and then the 25th anniversaries, oh my gosh, my friends were coming back uh, not happy with their lives. And very many of them had gotten divorced and their spouses had remarried and they were raising their chi my classmates' children on the other side of the country, alienated from them. And I guarantee that none of my classmates ever planned when they graduated from the, the business school to go out and get divorced and have children who hate, hate their guts and are being <laughs> raised by other children. And yet a very large portion of our, my classmates actually implemented a strategy that they never <laughs> planned to do. And it turns out that the reason why they do that is the very same mechanism. And that is the pursuit of achievement. So we all, everybody here, is driven to achieve. And when you have an extra ounce of energy or 30 minutes of time, instinctively and unconsciously, you'll allocate it to whatever activities in your life give you the most immediate evidence of achievement. And our careers provide that immediate evidence of achievement. We close a sale, we ship a product, we finish a presentation, we close, close a deal, we get promoted, we get paid. And our careers provide the most very tangible, immediate achievement. In contrast, investments in our families don't pay off for a very long time. In fact, on a day-to-day -day basis, our children misbehave over and over again. And it really isn't until 20 years down the road that you can look at your children and be able to put your hands on your hips and say, we, do, we raise great children. But on a day-to-day -day basis, um, achievement doesn't f at hand when we invest in relationships with our family, with our children and our spouses. And as a consequence, people like you and I who plan to have a happy life because our families truly are the deepest source of happiness in our lives, find that, that although that's what we want, the way we, we invest our time and energy and talents causes us to implement a strategy that we wouldn't at all plan to pursue. And so I wanted to just offer that one as something to think about. Um, the reason why successful companies fail is they invest in things that provide the most immediate and tangible evidence of achievement. And the reason why they have such a short time horizon is that they are run by people like you and I. And we then apply that very same uh, thinking process in our personal lives with sad results. Hmm. This book has been huge for me personally. What Clay's book did was point out to me the interrelationship between personal life and work life and that we often fall into the addictive trap of all the success and feedback you get professionally and run the big risk of not putting the same effort and attention towards your personal life. The lesson here is you need to treat both as equally important and you need to be as rigorous and committed and active on your personal life to the same extent of your professional life. But here's the big trap. The problem is everything in our personal lives, it's a long-term play. It doesn't have that immediate dopamine release. You know, it is a longer, slower burn that doesn't give you that immediate feedback. So we kind of get hooked to the instant feedback that work gives us, but we have to watch out for the risk 
that just because, you know, bringing up children, really the payoff there is maybe when the kids are 20 or 30. So don't neglect the 20 years before because you won't get the end result. To me, this book beautifully points out this powerful reminder, pay attention to both your professional and personal lives and be aware that naturally work can sort of distract us. So Mark, I want to ask you, how have you navigated, if you will, Clay's other dilemma between measuring not only our professional life, but our personal life too? It's hard. You have to make explicit choices to deal with it. You know, otherwise you get tied into the day-to-day. And I loved how he was able to tie the innovator's dilemma into the personal side. It was uh, quite a surprise when I read through the book. But as a personal example, as I was starting these shops in the maker movement, trust me, (laughs) I was on the road constantly. I was typically out of uh, my home city for four or five days at a time, you know, every single week. But I chose to be the coach of my son's elementary and junior high basketball team. And it required me to manage, and again, we get back to that term, rather than respond, manage my commitments at work. And so I made every game. I made most practices. And, you know, if I had to fly down to L.A. and back to San Francisco, then that's just what I did. I'm no, certainly no perfect father, but it was an explicit choice to make that time commitment and pour discipline and excellence into my, actually both of my sons. And it's something that has to be managed. You just keep going achievement day to day, particularly in a work environment, and you're not investing in family, you know, you're going to end up in the place that Clay was describing. And so, you know, Sundays are for my wife and I carve time out for my kids. I did it because I'm investing in the long term. I want my kids to be my friends. I want my grandkids to honor and respect me. My wife, we've been 32 years now. I want her to be my wife for the rest of my life. I've invested so much in these. Like, why would I want something different? But it requires a focus and a management of our time, resources, and commitment in order to pull that off. And will I ever get the jet that I want? You know, I don't know. Who cares? It's not going to be as fulfilling, right, as Thanksgiving or Christmas with my family. There is this little mantra that I often remind myself of is nobody sits on their deathbed wishing they had worked more. The thing that that you mentioned right at the end, Mark, is, you know, how he ties it from not just innovators dilemma, but, you know, the practice of management in business to your personal life. I, I just love that he thought to ask that question of, well, I've been an academic for 30 plus years. What can I learn from the realm of business and try and apply it to my personal life and and share those learnings with others? And the allocation of resources is just one definition of business strategy or what, you know, leadership and managers inside of a business do. And so just turning that question internally, I think is really fascinating. And what the book spurred inside of me was just to be asking the questions, the little question of the title is, how will I measure my life? Because everyone's answer is going to be a bit different. Some people have kids and grandkids, some people don't. Some people love to travel and some people don't. And so just being sure that you're continually asking those questions and then you're allocating those resources to help you fulfill the long-term objectives behind those questions, that's really what this book had spurred inside of me. Yeah, and it sounds like where we're leading towards here is make conscious decisions, make conscious choices and build structured habits, you know, that help us keep the commitments to the things that we really value. The way I relate to this is that business and our careers, I mean, if you're all in for the work you do and for your role and for your career, The self-discipline required is to like close the computer at night. There will always be work to do. So create time and space for the other things, because I think the greatest challenge we all face in the professional universe is that there's always more work to do. And so we can find ourselves working very long days deep into the night. And I think it's about making the choice like, okay, I'm done for today. And I feel like I try very hard 
to draw that line, to shut everything down and to be with my family. But I do believe this is the modern day pressure. Everything is in real time. The world has never been flatter. There is alerts and notifications. There's always something to read, a note to send, a call to plan. But I would say that the greatest attention needs to go to is just drawing that line and saying, I need to spend time with my friends, with my family, on myself. And I think that's when you look at the challenge that Clay presents to us in how will you measure your life, that's where it gets real every single day. Do you find that that's the true test, Mark, every single day is where do you draw the line? It's critical to create that balance, whether it's every day or every week, you've got to have that balance in place. One of the things I really loved about that book was his recognition for serendipity, that he wasn't necessarily saying that, you know, when you graduate from B school or you graduate from whatever you finish training, you've got your life mapped out ahead of you and it's going to be a straight line from point A to point B. You know, he talked about wanting to be the editor of the New York Times. You know, then he got a consulting job and he thought maybe that'll help him, you know, be a better editor at the New York Times. And then uh, he got an opportunity to start a company and he figured, well, start a company that'll probably help me be a better writer at the New York Times. And then he ended up being a professor and he was thinking, well, maybe that'll help me, you know, be a great editor at the New York Times. And then he discovered, wow, I really have enjoyed my life (laughs) and maybe the New York Times will call me. (laughs) And what was fascinating in the book, he also described that serendipity in the context of companies where, you know, Honda motorcycle came to the U.S., tried to knock off Harley Davidson's and ended up creating the off-road dirt bike industry. You know, they actually weren't that interested in it initially, but their local folks needed to cash and that's where they were getting the money, even if it was a little margin. And my point there was like Clayton was really balanced. It's like, you know, have your objectives, but hold them loosely. Hold your values more closely. It's like, what is it that you're driving to? What attributes of what it is that you're driving to? Don't forget that it's a very long game. And if you focus on the short term, that game is going to end. And then what do you have? Exactly. Chad, as you think about practical things you're going to think about on being accountable to your personal life, what are some of the things you're going to be putting into place? What are the sort of habits and rituals you're going to build so that you can achieve that harmony? The simplest one for me is just how long has it been since my last touch point with extended family members? I'm fortunate enough to live in a city where I have two out of three siblings, and so I can get together with them. But also, you know, what are my touch points with my parents and other extended family members as well? So I think for me, it's like, you know, has it been five days since I've seen or talked to a family member or has it been 20 days? And if it's 20 days, you know, that's my red flag moment where I know I need to uh, reach out and get in touch with someone because it's so true that those are the people that will be there for you no matter what, and, and you'll be there for them as well. And it can often get so lost in the day-to-day focus on work and our professional lives. I have the same thing. I literally have in my Todoist app, I literally have a recurring weekly to-do of call my mom. And it's a, so helpful because it gets to me and I'm like, oh, I've got to call her. And it, funnily enough, today it's popped up on my to-do list. So I will make time today to call her. And that's just a simple way in which I am trying to make sure I measure my life correctly and I'm doing the, th- the right things. Listen, before we wrap up, Mark Hatch, our listeners have only had a dash of your epic tales of founding Tech Shop. They've had only a sense of the prolific work you've done in innovation. I mean, oh my gosh, you've written several books around the maker movement. You've written for Fast Company. How do our listeners get more Mark Hatch in their life? Where can they find you on that famous thing called the internet? (laughs) MarkRHatch.com. It's got the link page. I'm fairly prolific with LinkedIn. Those are the best places. Yeah, we'll link to your books too. We'll give you the moonshots boost there on Amazon. (laughs) And uh, Chad, what a wonderful adventure together with Mark, you, I, and all of our listeners. We've revisited, without a doubt, one of our true favorites, Clayton Christensen. We've had not only the joy to decode that classic innovators dilemma, but also being able to ask 
ourselves that very big, scary, very hairy question of how will you measure your life? How do you feel post Clay Christensen revisited? I'm already thinking of what upcoming shows we can invite more guests on. Mark, it was a real pleasure to have a a third voice here on the show to maybe bust Mike and I out of our little moonshots echo chamber here. (laughs) Hey, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, we are so glad to have a friend on the show and we will have lots of links to not only your books, but to your blog and to LinkedIn so people can track you down. Look, Chad, we pause on these epic innovation writers such as Sinek, Collins, and Christensen. We are about to get a whole lot of girl power going on. Why don't you just remind our listeners what's coming next? Yeah, we've got a trifecta of shows diving deep into the wisdom of Michelle Obama, Melinda Gates, and Ariana Huffington. I think we have to bring on a guest for at least one of those shows, Mike. We'll have to put out our feelers for that. But yeah, I'm very excited. I'm huge fans of all three of those individuals and can't wait to do some deep dives uh, on each of them. Sounds great. Well, listen, Chad, Mark, it has been a wonderful adventure. Thank you both to you. Thank you to all our listeners. This was a big, huge, epic, and thoroughly enjoyable deep dive on episode 68 into the world of Clayton Christensen. Thanks to all of you, and we'll catch you next time on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.